Let's read 1 Corinthians 14 now together. Beginning in verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones that has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being so good to us, your people. Father, you provide. Truly, you own the cattle on a thousand hill. And Father, you are in a consistent provision uh, for us, your sons, your daughters, that you have graciously adopted into your family. Lord, we didn't have homes, but you gave us your home. You get, put your robe on our backs, your signet ring on our fingers. You made us something that we were not, and we stand in awe of your work. We stand in awe of your heart. We stand in awe of the great salvation that you bring to us, Father, as we walk through some, some difficult texts. Lord Jesus, we're, we're so finite. There's so much we don't understand. But help us as we navigate through your word. Help us to be serious about understanding your word this morning. It is in the name of Jesus Christ. Every Christian said, amen. amen. Okay, here we go. We're going to break this up into two parts. We're going to be in a lot of scripture. We're going to do just a, a little uh, seminary class in uh, uh, systematic theology. Because I don't want to just park here. Uh, I want to show you and unpack for you uh, what some of these things mean. So we're going to break this down into two parts. First part, we're going to talk about prophecy and what it means to prophesy, uh, why there seems to be multiple people in the early church uh, engaging in prophecy in their worship services. Uh, and then we're going to switch. We're going to talk about ladies and being quiet. And we're going to talk about the role of male and female and marriage and how this is supposed to look and what exactly this means. Because we know ladies are talking in church. We know that from 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, right? They're praying and they're prophesying in church, so this can't be a, just a, an absolute ban that all women have to have your masks on when you come to church and you can't open your mouth. That can't be what it means. So, prophecy, then ladies talking in church, and by God's grace, we're going to get some gospel in there and leave here loving Jesus more, amen? Woo, that's what I really, 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 really want. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others weigh what is said. Now, we've already defined what prophecy is. And go with me really quick to 1 Peter chapter 4 because I like to take my definitions for things straight out of the Bible. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verses 10 or 11, Peter is speaking about spiritual gifts. We learn that from verse 10. Let's read it. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. What is the purpose of all the gifts? The purpose of all the gifts, all of them, each and every one, is to be thinking about the brother on your left, the sister on your right, so that we can be built up together for the good of everyone, so that we can make much of Jesus in this world as his people, as the church. So if you have received a gift... Use it to serve. It's not self-seeking. Love's not proud. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not about you. Use the gift to serve your brothers and sisters as good stewards of God's varied grace. Man, God gives a, he has a lot of grace and he has a lot of gifts uh, and he, he gives those gifts to us so that we can serve one another and make much of Jesus. Whoever speaks 
as one who speaks the oracles of God and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. It's always all about Jesus. Everything we do to serve one another should lift up Jesus. But two different gifts are mentioned here, a speaking gift, speaking the oracles of God, and then the serving gift. We see those gifts in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. We saw them there too. They're in Ephesians 4. But here Peter just mentions the two. And and speaking the oracles of God is how I have always defined the gift of prophecy. It's It's the ability that God gives you, whether it's through study or whether it's supernaturally in a moment. You just have some truth that comes straight from God's word and you're able to speak that rightly into the life of a brother or a sister, uh, maybe in a small group or maybe in the hallway outside of a church service. But God just, he helps you get the right words to say at the right time to, to clearly declare the oracles of God. Who is the gift of prophecy for? Ladies, you're going to like this because we know that it's for our sons and our daughters. Look at Acts chapter 2, one of the great things that God did uh, in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is he he made women just as much a part of the New Testament church as the men. You know, in the ancient world, there was a lot of places women couldn't go. There was a lot of things women couldn't do. And, And Christ Jesus in his church levels the playing field. As you hear me say all the time, the cross of Jesus Christ levels the playing field. We are all in need at the foot of the cross, and we are all equal in our need for the salvation that that we need to have because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when we sin, we deserve death and hell, but God is good, amen? He lived the perfect life. He died in our place for our sins so that we could receive the salvation that we desperately need. On the day of Pentecost... When the Holy Spirit, remember this is a unique event that happens in history. It was prophesied by Joel, uh, and you can read Joel chapter 2, verse 28, uh, but we're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Peter is just preaching the sermon that Joel preached, and, and what he's doing, he's saying, this is that. This is the thing that, that God has been promising he would do. His Holy Spirit is now upon all flesh, sons and even daughters. We can all now rightly declare the gospel. We can rightly declare the true oracles of God. Look at Acts chapter two. And man, I went back and watched my sermon from last week. I don't normally do that because it's just, it's too painful and embarrassing. (laughs) But I did it last week and man, I talk fast. Uh, And I can already tell I'm doing it right now. So I'm gonna try to slow down here. Acts chapter two. Let's go to verse 17. Now again, remember, They pour out of the upper room and they're all speaking in languages that other people can hear them declaring, uh, uh, declaring uh, oracles of God, worshiping God uh, in in their own language that they shouldn't have been able to speak. And that gets everybody's attention. But remember, tongues is always an upward language. They hear them worshiping God. Then Peter preaches a sermon in Koine Greek, a language that they should all at least know a little bit of because that's how they would buy and sell and trade. They all had to know Koine Greek. You can thank Alexander the Great for that. No time. Verse 17, Peter's preaching the sermon. And in the last days it shall be, God declares. At the incarnation of Jesus Christ, you and I, we have entered. You know, you hear preachers all the time. I believe we're in the last days. We've been in the last days since Jesus Christ came. Okay? Uh, There is only one thing that has to happen from here on out, and that is the return of Christ to wrap this thing up in the pretty bow that God is going to wrap it up in. So the last days began with the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And just so you know, chapter uh, 15 is coming. We're going to spend four weeks in chapter 15. You want to talk about some gospel resurrection power? That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. No more gifts, just risen Christ and the glory that that we get to experience in his perfect resurrection. Verse 17, in the last days it shall be, God declares, 
that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. What is prophecy? Prophecy is the right declaring of the true oracles of God. Who's it for? It's for everybody in the church. We should all want to be able to rightly speak the gospel, to rightly speak uh, the words that God has given us. We can know what's true. We can know what's right because God has given it to us. Amen. So prophecy is the ability whether it's uh, regurgitation from studying or whether it's spontaneous in a moment to rightly declare the oracles of God in somebody's life in a way that, that, that means something, that powerfully impacts them, that, that, that picks them up and encourages them in the gospel and encourages them in the Lord. That's what prophecy is. Who's it for? It's for everybody. Now turn to Acts chapter 11. I wish I could just close my Bible and leave it at that. But I can't. There's this guy named Agabus in Acts chapter 11. We find him again in Acts chapter 21. I just want you to read the text. You make up your own mind when we're done here. But uh, we've got to read about Agabus before we move on. Because it's not just as simple as what I said. It is what I just said. But it's not as simple. So Acts chapter 11 verses 27 through 30 Let's read the first time we see Agabus in the book of Acts. Oh, I'll start in verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. This is where we started being known as Christians. The word from uh, means little Christ, follower of Christ. Verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem. Prophets. Now, here's what we know about the New Testament. There's a difference between the office of prophet and the gift of prophecy. We know that from Hebrews uh, chapter 1. Let's just read that real quick. Uh, I think I quoted it before, but I want you to hear this. Because Jesus Christ, there were prophets. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus Christ completely fulfilled everything that the law and everything those Old Testament prophets said. Uh, when we study Zechariah. Uh, next uh, year. Some of you probably aren't going to like me if you're of the dispensational mindset because uh, it's just hard for me to take that 70th week of Daniel and still have it out here someplace when Jesus said he already fulfilled everything that the prophets said. I, I believe that about Zechariah too. I believe even Zechariah chapter 14 can completely be seen as fulfilled in the days of Jesus Christ, his life, death, burial, and resurrection. I'm in Philemon, not Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, let's read. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. God used to speak through the prophets. God needed to raise up men who would come along and say, thus saith the Lord. But he doesn't have to do that anymore because Jesus Christ, God himself, has come and wrapped himself in flesh and given us everything. Thing we need to be Christians, to be followers of Christ, to be little Christ, the light of the world, shining the light of Christ through our lives. But in Acts chapter 12, you still got these guys that are called prophets. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus. Ladies, if you're pregnant or trying to be, there, there are better names in the Bible than Agabus. One of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit. Okay, Ugh, Brent, this makes me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable too. But this guy 
in a New Testament role, has been given a gift of prophecy, and he does foretell the future, not only here, but in verse 21, chapter 21 rather, uh, as well. Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world, and this took place in the days of Claudius, which we know this actually happened. We have secular records of this happening. We know the great diaspora. Uh, the Jews were blamed on this famine. They were kicked out of uh, uh, the city of Rome at the time of this. So Agabus says this is going to happen, uh, and he foretells the future, and uh, it does occur. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So famine's going to come. It's going to be bad. The church pulls together to love on their brothers and sisters at another place at this time. Look at Acts chapter 21 now, because we're going to see Agabus again. You guys having fun? All right. Verses 10 through 14. Chapter 21, and let's, let's actually read up a little bit higher because we've also got Peter the Evangelist and his daughters are prophetess. Let's start in verse 7. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Tolemus, and we were greeted by the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. They declared rightly the oracles of God. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt. Now remember our moniker for this series. And just know, when we're reading the Bible, this is weird, okay? He takes, well, while we were staying there for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard this, we and the people were urged, uh, there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. But then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Man, you just got to love Paul here. But, but here's this guy, Agabus, again. And he comes with a foretelling of the future. And he says, Paul, look at the way I'm binding myself up with the belt. This is what they're going to do to you when you go to Jerusalem. And of course, everybody in the church is upset. They're crying. They don't want this to happen to Paul. But Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen. He's ready to go. Doesn't matter. So what do we do with Agabus? And what do we do with 1 Corinthians? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is a New Testament church service. Let two or three prophets speak. Let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made or another sitting, to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and be encouraged. Uh, again, what's the purpose of prophecy? To rightly speak the oracles of God so we can all be encouraged and grow up in the gospel so we can make much of Jesus together. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for God is not a God of confusion but of peace. So what do we do with Agabus? Remember what the book of Acts is. Right, there's a lot of churches uh, that say, hey, it's in the Bible, so foretelling of the future is still a real thing. It's part of the gift of prophecy in the church. So, so let's take some time and, and who has a word to speak from the Lord about what's going, coming down the pipeline. I, I've been, listen, and there are churches who do, I mean, there's crazy churches out there. But there are some churches that are trying to be faithful to Scripture that do a better job of it than others. Oh, uh, Really, the only guy I can think of who uh, has a great deal of 
uh, respect. And Sarah and I got to meet he and his wife at an Acts 29 retreat. Sam Storms. How many of you are familiar with Sam Storms, his church, and his ministry? Right? Sam's a good dude. Uh, he is a reformed brother. He preaches the word. He gets the gospel right. They go through books of the Bible. But in his effort to be faithful to all scripture, they have a prophecy time at the end of their service where just anybody can speak. And then they sit around and they judge what's being spoken about. Because, man, if somebody's going to get up and say, I'm going to rightly declare uh, the oracles of the Lord, uh, you need some good mature brothers in there uh, to make sure that the words are being tested, amen? Uh, so that they are, to, to, to know that they are true. Turn to First Thessalonians 5. I wasn't gonna do all of this, but I'm going to now, so just get ready. We've talked about First uh, Thessalonians before in this series. Just look at chapter four, uh, or chapter five really quickly, verses 20 and 21. And again, if you're uncomfortable me too. <laughs> but this is our Bible, and we have to do something with it. Amen? So look at verse 20. Look at verse 19 first. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Right? So, there, so there is, at the end of chapter 14, don't despise prophecies. Don't despise Tongues, they make me feel weird. I'm uncomfortable. I don't want anybody standing up and interrupting the service. Uh, I don't want that either, but we should not despise prophecy, the spiritual gift, and we should not despise tongues either according to Scripture, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So what's happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 14? There are people with the gift... There it is. There are people with the gift of prophecy, and there is a time in their service where uh, anyone can speak, and, uh, and then the other people with the gift of prophecy are either shaking their head going, that's good, that encourages me, that helps me leave here loving Jesus more, or uh, that was complete garbage, you don't speak anymore in church. Right, that's the spirit, the spirits of the prophets uh, uh, working out, testing uh, prophecies that are made in church. Now remember, Acts chapter 2, Agabus, a lot of people give a lot of credit there, but Acts is history. It's just simply telling the story of how things happen in the first church. Just because something happens in Acts doesn't mean it has to happen all the time. But here in 1 Corinthians 14, like I told you last week, there's a lot of Things the New Testament church did that we don't do anymore. Here, the way that I want to approach this is prophecy is great. And I'm sorry, small group leaders, you're, you might hate this. But uh, small group is probably the best avenue for something like this occurring in our lives. When we're sitting down, hopefully you've been in small group a while. Hopefully you know those people, you know their hearts, you're known by them and, known, uh, and they know you. I could see something like this happening in that, uh, in, in that kind of scenario. But uh, as a church here, as a gathered body on Sunday, our church is big. We can't just have people standing up and talking and interrupting the service. So this is our Bible. We honor what it says. We trust what it says. I preach it just like it said, but we're not looking for this to happen. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Are we trekking? I want to honor my Lord. I want to honor my Savior. Some of this stuff makes me uneasy, but I still got to preach it because all scriptures God breathed, amen? Please don't come up with me and have a word for the Lord after church because I'm going to test it and you will not like the testing. <laughs> All right, we got 20 minutes. Let's talk about women being quiet. Are you ready? Oh, one, one more place, Revelation 19. Go to Revelation 19 real quick. I love this because it just, remember, everything we do should make much of Jesus. Everything should be for us all to be built up together 
so that Jesus can be made more in our lives. We, we need to leave here loving Jesus more. And that's, this is how I want to wrap up this, this time talking about prophecy because it's how Revelation wraps it up. And the angel, he's speaking to John, the revelator, who's writing this down. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't, don't you just love the angels in the Bible? Uh, he fell down to worship this angel and the angel said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, worship God alone for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I've heard a lot of guys try to prophesy. I've heard a lot of guys do a, a lot of funky things and I always know it's wrong if it's not making much of Jesus. So let everything, all the gifts work together at Four Points Church for the making much of Jesus. We know when Jesus is being made much of, we're doing something right. We're doing it the correct way. Amen? So do we have a lot of questions about prophecy in this part of 1 Corinthians 14? Yep. But here's one thing we know that we know that we know, even in the midst of other questions we may have, if we're making much of Jesus, we're doing it the right way. Praise the name of the Lord. All right, back to, let's talk about ladies. As in all the churches of the saints, I can't wait to take a couple weeks off, just so you guys know. <laughs> The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they should be in submission as the law also says. Now, we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5 that ladies are praying. Just let's read verse 5 together since I'm, I'm right here on the page. Every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. So we know in this early New Testament church that women had speaking roles. Paul says, I do not forbid a woman to prophesy. What is prophecy? It's the spoken truth of God's word. It's the rightly declared oracles of God. And there were women who were allowed, and it was right and okay to pray in church, to sing in church, to even prophesy a spoken role in church. So what can this mean about being silent as in all the churches? We know ladies had huge roles. Uh, uh, there's uh, Deborah, there's um, Chloe, there's, there's uh, uh, Junia, uh, there's all kinds of women that are major uh, servants in these churches uh, that are ministering and, and serving the Lord and helping people make much of Jesus and, and making much of Jesus. So, so what can this mean? Should a woman be silent for this? Let's go all the way back to Genesis. Are you ready? We're going to have fun. You're not with me. All the way back to Genesis. Because we've got to unpack this. Because I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers. Paul says that all throughout the letters that he writes, we need to know how this stuff works. So we go back to Genesis because every time Paul talks about men and women, male and female in the New Testament, every time Jesus talks about marriage, male and female, men and women, they both, Paul and Jesus, ground what they teach in places. We're not going to go to Colossians 3 or Ephesians 5. I hope you know those household codes. We're going to hit a lot of other stuff. But we do want to ground what we know about men and women in the creation story. And listen, if there's ever been a time, so what I pray for you right now, clarity. Just as we've been walking through 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, so many people have said things are it's still kind of crazy. You know, I wish it wasn't there, but at least it's been made clear to me uh, why some of these things are here. I, I want you to have clarity today on your role, men, in marriage, in the church, and your role, ladies, in marriage, in the church, because our world's confused. Our world doesn't know the difference anymore between men and women. 
They think there's this spectrum and there's all these little different places that you can find yourself uh, in masculinity and femininity, but it's just not true. There is men and there is women and there are unique, specific roles that God has given to each because we need one of each in the church and in our marriages and in our families, amen? Takes a boy and a girl. I'm not going to say anything else about that. Some of you know in the past I've said some things that's real funny, but probably not appropriate. Takes both. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. And why is God talking in plural? Because he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is three yet one. Is the mystery of our Yahweh creator, God. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what does God do uh, as he's, he's spoken light into existence? He's uh, separated the firmaments. He's given us atmosphere. Uh, he's planted trees and uh, gardens. He's, he's created everything. And then on the sixth day, the pinnacle of his creation, he does something in his own image and in his own likeness. Here's what that tells us already about male and female. Both equally honored by God to be made in the image and likeness of God. Both male and female are honored. They have the exact same dignity, value uh, before God uh, uh, because they're made both in his image and in his likeness. Equal value, equal honor, equal dignity. Uh, male and female, equal but different. Equal as image bearers of God, but given different roles. Let's look in chapter two now. Some people uh, confuse chapter one and two. They say, why is there two creation stories? There's not two creation stories. There's simply the over the overwhelming uh, epic of creation that chapter one tells us kind of the whole, the, the whole bang of creation in chapter one. And then chapter two, uh, we get a 30,000 foot view and, and God begins to dissect creation a little bit so we can have some more understanding about this male and female uh, equal but different. Look at, look at verse 18 quickly in, in chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good. Now remember, Adam was made first. And Adam is noticing all the animals. We're not going to read all of that, but it's all there in chapter 2. He's noticing that everybody's got a partner. But he's looking around and he doesn't have a partner. And God says... And it's not because God made a mistake. When God says something in the Bible, it's for our benefit. He wants us to know something, amen? He says, it's not good for man to be alone. Is there any man in this room that would like to challenge the word of the Lord on that? Do not stand up and be a prophet right now. You will be tested. It is not Good. Look, I have been a single guy. It's not good. I have been at my house when Sarah goes to ladies retreat or something like that. My kids almost die every time Sarah leaves. <laughs> it's just not good. Now, God put a lot of responsibility on man. I mean, he's got the entire guard. He's got the animal kingdom. He, he's naming all the, the animals. There's a lot of responsibility that God has put on the shoulders of man. And God knows that man is never going, uh, never going to be that. He's going to need help with all the responsibilities that he has been given. So, verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. 
And we know that God puts Adam to sleep, right? Adam was made from the dust of the ground. The Bible says that, that God uh, formed him out of the dust and blew into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. But for, for, for the woman, it's different. Equal, but different. He puts Adam to sleep and from the side, from Adam's own rib, he fashions a woman and presents her to uh, Adam who says, whoa, man. Right? I the, the whole beauty of the creation story is they were naked and not ashamed. Okay? It's just a beautiful thing. Amen? But from the, from the rib, why did God do it that way? To show this compatibility, this side-by-side -side companionship. Man needs woman. He needs her. She is the suitable helper for him. And they look different. They are different. There's a difference between male and female. But they're equal. But they are different. And they're given and assigned different roles to the man. God, uh, let's look at chapter, let's look at chapter 3 in the fall. Verse 16, here's how, here's how we know already in Genesis that they're different. They've been given different roles. Man is created larger, stronger. He's bigger, not so he can be a bully, not so he can abuse, but so he can protect and provide for his helper, for his wife, for the family that they will, uh, their loins will fill the garden, right? Uh, uh, conquer and multiply. And, and that's what Jesus tells. That's what God told them to do. But they sin. And here's, here in the fall, we can already see some of the differences between these equal male and female people. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire, look at this, ladies. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. What do you think that means? It means you always are trying to take the wheel. It is the desire in you that comes from sin that causes you to constantly try to take. And we know, by the way, that's what it means. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. If you, he's talking to uh, Cain. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, talking about sin. Now, its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. This is, ladies, this is what God teaches us about the deepest desire of your heart. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Guys, how many of you know the Bible is true? Sometimes when we're driving in a car, I just look over at Sarah, and she's just looking at me with that look. You know that look. You are the stupidest man <laughs> on the face of God's green planet Earth. Huh? That's biblical. <laughs> now look, look at what he says. To we've, we've got to start hurrying. I've got six minutes. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because you guys, have you ever wondered why everything is so stinking hard all the time? It's because of sin. In pain, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread, and then guess what? Then you're going to die because dust is what you were made from, and dust is what you're going to return to. Enjoy your life. Man has been given responsibility to protect and to provide, to work the fields, to produce something with his hands that is a benefit to his wife, that is a benefit to, her sp uh, to, to the family that they create together. Ladies, you are to work alongside your husband, honoring him, trusting him, knowing how hard he's working and helping him in that work. He needs your help. We know from Scripture, and let's look some other... Uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter uh, 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 
Now again, you've got to read Ephesians 5 on your own. You've got to read Colossians 3 on your own. You've you got to understand the household codes. But here's one we don't talk about uh, all that much in 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 5. Equal but different. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Listen, listen, just real careful. Every time women are spoken to in Scripture, every time they're told to submit to their husbands. Every time. Adam was created first. The prophets that God raised up were all men. The kings God raised up were all men. The priests God raised up was all men. John the Baptist came as a man. Jesus Christ came as a man. Jesus Christ chose 12 men to follow him. They chose more men after them to follow because responsibility for protection and provision falls on the shoulders, the square wide shoulders of the man. Every time in scripture it's this way. Just like every time for women, they're told to submit. Brent, I don't like those verses. You don't have to like them, but it's God's word. And your role, ladies, can a woman have a job outside them? Of course she can. Proverbs 31 talks about uh, that, that, that virtuous woman who makes her wares and goes out to the temple court or goes out to the, the gates and sells her wares. It's not about you not being able to work or having to stay home or anything like that. But it is about responsibility, helping, and submissions. This is how we honor God being male. This is how we honor God being female. This is how we honor God as Christian families in this gender-confused world. Look at this. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives. And ladies, come on. You know our job's harder than yours. It just is. You should feel sorry for us and stop trying to take the wheel from us. We've got a responsibility. But likewise, husbands, ladies, it is so easy. I've never seen, I've never seen a godly woman hate not being honored by her husband. When you love a woman well, she will be a lovely woman. Amen? Amen? If you love a woman well, she'll be a lovely woman. Husbands, this is, this is for us. This is what we've got to do. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in a understanding way. You know what that word can also be translated as? Sensitive. <laughs> be sensitive with your wives. Listen, they will love you they will it will not they will be able to intelligently and willingly submit to you don't be like that guy that i've had so many times in a counseling session who who looks at me and says tell my wife she has to listen to what i say that's not going to get you anywhere by the way they're divorced <laughs> likewise husbands Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, wives, male, female. Here's what we can't do. We, we can't be egalitarian with God's word when God's word's very clear on roles of men and women. Right. Let me answer a simple question for you. I, I'm already so deep in a hole. Anyway, I got. I can just say whatever I want now. <laughs> Should a woman be a pastor? Answer: No. We are complementarian. Male and female are equal. 
but different. They have been given different roles that complement one another. You can't exchange a role for one that God did not give to you. It's rebellion. It's sin. All these feminists, all these crazy people out there shaking their fists at God saying, uh, it's not about how you have made me or created me. I'm going to do what I want. You made me a boy. I'm going to be a girl. You made me a girl. I'm going to be a boy. I don't care what roles you have assigned for me. I'm going to do things my way. It's, it's rebellion. It's satanic. We go, well, God has given us our marching orders. We know who we are. We know what we're supposed to be doing. We've got to obey the commands of Christ. Back to 1 Corinthians 14, let's wrap this up. So what is this not speaking in the church when we know they can pray? They pray, look at, look what happens, look at the context of this. It's as the leaders of the church are giving and weighing prophecies that have been spoken in the church. Prophecies can be spoken by a man or a woman. Rightly declaring the oracles of God. It's during the judgment and weighing of these prophecies that a woman should be silent and let their husbands uh, discuss what was the true word from the Lord. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 really quick. We'll talk more about lady pastors. Which, by the way, I grew up in a church that is egalitarian. They all the... There's no more Galatians 3. There's no more male or female anymore. All are equal in Christ. Well, there's still boys and girls, though. There's still roles and responsibilities. And you can't confuse them. That's what the alphabet community does. There are Christians who use, you know you're using a verse wrong when you agree with the alphabet community. You're just getting it wrong. There is male and there is female. Look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 really quick. How you doing? Give me five more minutes. Let's start verse eight. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Which, by the way, ladies, you're not the only people on planet Earth that are told to submit. Men have to submit just like you do. The reason that Paul wants during prayer for men to lift up their hands is to show their submission to God, to their creator. Uh, This is not all about us. It's not King Kong time. No, we men are in submission as well as women. That's why in uh, Ephesians 5, we're told to submit to one another before he actually gets into the household codes there. Man, I'm saying a lot of things. I hope you're keeping up. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without arguing or quote. Likewise, also that the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Ladies of four points, thank you so much uh, for the way you dress, for the way you conduct yourselves. You are godly, good women, not like so many of the floozies that are everywhere out there, Kardashian wannabe, walking around half naked. Boo! Boo! Likewise, women adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire. And and you've got some cultural things. It's not a sin to braid your hair. There's some cultural ways uh, uh, prostitutes looked uh, in this day and age. And Paul's basically saying, don't thanks for not dressing like a prostitute. But with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit, now here, here we go. What what kind of talking can a woman not do in a church? I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control. And ladies, how are you saved through childbearing? It, it's the, that's the way that Jesus Christ became incarnate. He, through Mary, uh, a woman, Christ was born. We're all saved uh, because of your ability to bring children into the world. But what is this not being able to talk? What does it mean? in 1 Corinthians 14. What does it mean here? Well, look where Paul goes next. 
He goes into the leadership of the church. He goes into talking about uh, who can be qualified to to oversee the church, to be an elder in the church, to be uh, the only time the word shepherding is used in the New Testament. It's always used in verb form connected to the elders and the overseers who are to be men according to Titus 1, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So what is this role of speaking that a woman should not be allowed to do? It would be the role of elder or uh, overseer uh, in the church. That's the kind of speaking. And listen, in the churches I grew up in, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because we don't just confuse scripture sometimes. Every woman I've ever seen pastoring a church or preaching in a pulpit, which only the elders should be allowed to do, it's so clear when they get on stage in a power suit. 1 Corinthians 11, women should be feminine. Women should look like women. Women should talk like women. But what do women preachers do? They get up in their power suits. They look just like men. They want to talk just like the men. Their their speech uh, is masculine in every way. Why? Because ultimately, no, deep down, that's not their role in the church. Nowhere in Scripture is there even the slightest glance that, that it would be their place. But no, in everywhere That's the kind of speaking a woman can't do in the church to preserve our roles of masculinity and femininity, male and female, so the world will will not continue to be confused. The church is the shining light of the gospel of Jesus Christ that that teaches the world. Not only our communication, but they see through our lives. That's the mystery of marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. It is a, uh, our marriages reflect the gospel to the world, and we've got to do it the right way. Amen? Woo! Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your word has so much to teach us. Father, I pray that somewhere in the last 50 minutes, of my attempts to proclaim your truth, that you will pour grace upon the men of this church and the women of this church. Father, may we understand the gift and role of prophecy. May we understand the place for man inside the service, the place for a woman inside the service. May we all be used by you with all the gifts that you give to to raise up and encourage our brothers and sisters. So Jesus Christ, we will make much of you. Thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name every Christian said, amen.